Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our hearing on the proposed 2018 Judiciary and Court Administration Operating Budget. Uh, before we begin, I do want to thank everyone for their work and preparation for today's hearing. Uh, City Attorney's Chief of Staff, Bill Hedrick, Franklin County Municipal Court Clerk, Lori Tyak, the Honorable Judge Barrows, and members of their staff. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'd also like to thank members of the public for taking the time to come down to City Hall and those tuning in from home to learn more about our budget process. I do want to remind those members of the public who wish to speak to please fill out a speaker slip before a public testimony portion of the hearing. Um, because we have the three um, different arms that fall under this uh, department, anyone with speaker slips, please provide them uh, in each segment and we'll take them all at one time so uh, different groups can go on their merry way. Uh, today, the purpose of today's hearing is to review and comment on the proposed 2018 operating budget for the city attorney's office, the office of the municipal court clerk and the Franklin County Municipal Court judges, all of which are available online at www.columbus.gov slash finance. This hearing is available to the public on the columbus.gov YouTube channel and is currently streaming live online on the CTV website and broadcasting on Spectrum Cable and WOW on Channel 3 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. I will now turn it over to the City Attorney's Office to uh, present uh, your 2018 budget. Uh, thank floor you. is all yours, Mr. Hedrick. Thank you, Councilman Stenziano. I also want to introduce Christy Plants from our office. She's the actual fiscal agent for the, the Columbus City Attorney's Office. Uh, today I would be presenting to you the proposed 2018 general fund budget proposal from the Columbus City Attorney's Office. This will be the last budget presented by uh, City Attorney Pfeiffer and his office. Um, I'm briefly going to go over the budget numbers and just do a very brief summary of some of the things that the office does, because the office does a lot of different things that sometimes the public doesn't realize. And feel free to ask me any questions along the way of the process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us to the third slide. And the third slide that I'm presenting today is a history of the budgets under City Attorney Pfeiffer. So what we're showing in these budgets, or what our projected budgets have been over the years and how much we've, we've spent. Um, City Attorney Pfeiffer ran a very frugal and office, so we were always able to do, we've always been within our budget every year when the city gives us a budget, we've always made that budget work. Over the years, our office under City Attorney Pfeiffer's administration actually has returned over $2,500,000 to the general fund. Uh, we do not have final figures for the end of this calendar year, but we do suspect that we will also have another refund going to the city this year as well. Um, last year, we did have a $800,000 increase to our budget. That was based on a lot of things, including the, the body-worn cameras, uh, discovery issues for that, and also in our improved technology has also improved, has increased some of our costs. Uh, this year, the city has proposed an increase of 800000 And the next slide will explain what that is. We actually had requested in our budget, and it appears that we will have the funding for uh, five additional positions. Uh, most of them are not even new positions. They are positions that in the past we have left vacant for budgetary purposes, that we've now reached the point where we think for efficiency purposes and to better serve the public, we need to fill those positions. So two of those are attorney's positions, two are support staff positions, and one is a legal advocate position. Um, with the exception of the legal advocate position, all the other positions were past budgeted positions that we just had not filled. So we decided it was time to fill those, and this budget allows us to fill those positions to better serve the public. I'm going to briefly just go over a couple of our sections, uh, what sections do exist in the office. There are also some statistics provided with those sections. Most of those statistics are for 2016. We do not have the 2017 statistics available at this time. Uh, among the things we do, the city attorney's office does, we have our civil division, we have our general counsel position. That section advises the city council, the mayor, and all the departments of the city. We are the legal attorney for the city of Columbus. So when legal advice is needed by a department, uh, department head or council or the mayor, 
the general counsel provides that legal advice. We also have a litigation section. The litigation section deals with whenever the city of Columbus is sued. That is the section we litigate those cases. So anytime, for instance, if fire or police or one another department is sued in some type of way, their attorneys are from the litigation section. We also have a labor and employment section. Obviously, the city of Columbus has a large number of employees, and sometimes there are a lot of legal disputes involving their employment or their dismissal from employment. The labor and employment section does all the legal cases involving that. They're also involved in multiple arbitrations, and they also provide legal advice to all the sections of the city. So again, if you have an employee issue, we often can prevent a lawsuit from happening because that section is called for legal advice and the people are told what they should or should not do based on the law and the facts that are presented before them. The claim section of the city is actually, it serves two parts. One, if someone is suing the city of Columbus for damages, let's say for instance, a trash pickup turns into an accident of some kind and damage is done to a citizen's property, that claim is filed with the City of Columbus and the claim section will investigate that. We will settle that claim if it's something that's meritorious that needs to be dealt with or we will contest it if that needs to happen. The claim section also serves to collect a large amount of tax dollars that are not paid by people that owe money to the City of Columbus. We do that by taking them to court, but we also try to work with them to set up payment programs so if based on their financial situation that they can meet their obligations with the, to the City of Columbus without us taking legal action against them. Next I have a slide for the prosecutor's division and this is often what people associate when they hear the Columbus City Attorney's Office. The Columbus City Attorney's Office is also responsible for prosecuting misdemeanor crimes within the city of Columbus. Over 116,000 cases were handled by our staff last year. Those can vary anything from a low level offense like a parking ticket or speeding ticket to a domestic violence case. So they run the gauntlet. So we are one of the busiest courts in the state of Ohio and actually one of the busiest courts actually in the United States. Part of that unit is also our domestic violence unit. Uh, we are unique in Columbus that we're, we've always been very forward thinking in how we've dealt with the issue of domestic violence. Any person that is a victim of domestic violence involved in a court case here in the city of Columbus will have an advocate that's assigned to their case that works specifically with them to review the situation and to provide them support when they're in court. We also are unique in that we have five domestic violence prosecutors who only handle domestic violence cases. So we also make sure that they're the most experienced, they're the most trained, and they're the most best able to address the kind of cases because often the dangers that are involved in these cases for both the victims and for society at large, these are often very violent individuals. We best try to deal with them and we also try to help the victims with the support to try to find other solutions also outside of the criminal case to provide them with the support they need to help them get out of those situations and also to let them know what resources are available to them, such as protective orders and other types of housing and those types of things. Uh, we have our appellate unit for the prosecutor's division listed as our next slide. Basically, the appellate unit for the prosecutor's unit does a couple things. We appeal decisions that we've feel that need to be appealed on criminal matters that have appeared before the uh, municipal court. They also provide legal support to all the staff members and attorneys that are practicing at the prosecutor's division. For instance, if you're in the middle of a trial and a legal issue comes up, our appellate unit is the person that's called and they provide legal advice to our staff so we can better able do our jobs. Uh, next, I have the Prosecutor's Resources Unit as one of our slides. This is the unit that deals with the public when people are trying to file criminal charges. So we are unique here in the city of Columbus that if you are a victim of a misdemeanor crime and charges have not been filed in the matter by the police, you'll be referred to the prosecutor's office. 
And what we will do is we will review the situation and see if it merits criminal charges or there's enough evidence for criminal charges. What we will also do is if there is not enough evidence for criminal charges, we will also make referrals, tell people how they can get protective orders, give them information on small claims court. We also have a mediation program that runs through that unit. So often if we have a neighborhood dispute, it is best solved among the neighbors by using this program rather than getting them involved in the criminal justice system, especially when you can see we have 116,000 cases a year. This is a great way of trying to mediate low-level disputes among neighbors with this program. We also have a checks program where if people are charged with writing bad checks, we try to mediate those and get those settled without having to file criminal charges. Next, we have a slide. We also provide all the legal advice for the Columbus Police. Um, our legal advisor is Jeff Furby and Dino Ryback. They're available 24-7 to the members of the Columbus Police Department. They also do all the training for the Columbus Police. So our hope is to make sure our police have all the legal resources they need and all the things that they to do their jobs properly. Also, we also provide legal videos for the police. Now, City Attorney Pfeiffer has stressed that they be very small in the amount of time, so we actually provide two to four minute videos to officers on a variety of legal issues for them to get updated on, and actually it's been very popular with the police officers, and we believe it's also been very effective. We also do a newsletter that goes to the police department which reviews current legal issues. It will specifically cover cases that have involved the Columbus Police, and it provides legal advice, particularly if statutes and laws have changed. Sometimes we do seasonal things. Certain times of year, other crimes are more common than others. We provide these legal updates to update the officers on how to handle those crimes. That newsletter is so popular that it's actually being used throughout the state, and other, de other municipal departments have asked to have copies of that that they can share with their police departments. Um, the next we have, which again, the city attorney's office is very unique, and city attorney Pfeiffer initiated this program, is the zone initiative. And what the zone initiative is, we actually have five attorneys that are assigned to the five police zones of the city. And they are there to deal with neighborhood issues and to use the law through the civil methods to shut down drug houses, problem bars, problem hotels, those types of things in the environmental court with injunctions. Um, we've been pr particularly successful the last couple years. We've shut down a lot of hotels that were problems. We've now been doing a lot with a lot of drug houses that we're getting injunctions on. And the zone team also not only does that, they go out to neighborhood meetings, uh, block watches, wherever they are in their zone. So they're, they are the face of the city attorney's office. They also know all the police officers in those zones so we can more effectively deal with problems on the ground, because one of the ways you can best deal with that is actually see the problems yourself. Uh, to be sitting in the office and be told, well, there's a problem house on the street is a lot different than having been on that street and seeing the problem itself. And these five individuals, which is also overseen by Steve Dunbar, who also has his own, do an outstanding job, and this continues to be an area where we continue to expand, and I think we are actually becoming the benchmark for other communities who want to borrow and do the same things that we are doing here in the city of Columbus. Let's see here. The last section I have is our real estate section. Among the other things that the city attorney's office does is the real estate section is involved anytime the city needs to acquire land. So we do that by several methods. Uh, one, we negotiate for purchase of the property, and then if that doesn't work out, then we also have to discuss what our options, options are legally for eminent domain. Also, you know, clearing titles for property and making sure that when the city needs property, this is the division that handles that. And it's actually millions of dollars of property are actually acquired each year through this department. And that is just a brief rundown of what the city attorney's office, some of our sections and some of the things we've done and the things that we do with the budget that city council provides us with, without that budget and without these funds, we would not be able to effectively do all the things we 
do. Um, we're proud. I think we do a really good job with the funds we have, and I think the City of Columbus gets a large return on the dollars they invest by all the services and the things that we do for the city and for its citizens. Uh, any, any questions, Council Member? Thank you, Mr. Hedrick. I always have questions. Yes. Uh, do appreciate the succinct uh, presentation. Uh, as a, an office in transition, uh, just curious if there's any thoughts of what the ballot budget allocation is, if there are any challenges uh, the future city attorney uh, should have in mind, or if this fulfills kind of the obligations that uh, fall kind of in past practice, uh, not always knowing what the future initiatives or desires may be. We've been really effective in that there's always, you always need re more resources. That's never a question. So the question is, what's the best job you can do with the resources that you're given? And with the additional funding that we've asked for with these positions, we think the city has been very generous to us in providing the funds that we will need to fulfill those obligations. A lot of the obligations and challenges that we face and the next administration may face may end up not being budgetary. It's just a matter of figuring out how to use the system you have already to effectively get something done. Uh, one of the challenges I think we will face and we need to we'll need to better examine how it's going to affect our operations will be the passage of Marcy's Law and how that will affect our contact with victims and the type of services that we provide for victims. Uh, we do a really, really good job providing advocacy for victims of domestic violence. Last year we managed to get a grant. We actually have two advocates that are now working with victims of violence that do not involve domestic violence. So at least now some assault victims can be getting services. But this is always an area that we need to look at possibly expanding and also with the new law that we will need to make sure we're adequately doing. If we are not, then we may have to in the future figure out how we may need more resources for that. But until the law takes effect and we see how it actually works out in the end, we won't know that for sure. So that's a possible future challenge that we could be facing. And only one more question, somewhat aligned with um, another uh, department that I chair, but just the use of technology and how um, the state attorney's office is maybe able to find efficiencies or looking to other best practices of using technology, not only for residents, but within um, the office. Curious if you have any thoughts on implementation or again, being an office in transition, uh, not quite knowing yet what the priorities may be and how technology could enhance those. This is a pretty easy answer for me to give, and I have to give a lot of credit where credit's due. Our current chief prosecutor, Laura Baker Morish, worked on a three-year initiative, at least three years plus, to introduce what's called the matrix system, and it is a system that will allow the office to basically become paperless on criminal cases. Um, City Council actually provided us with significant funds. I believe three or four hundred thousand dollars actually came from the capital fund to implement this. Um, Ms. Baker has been, all technology programs and transitions take a large amount of time. And she has worked extensively on this. Uh, I would say we're about 60 to 70 percent to where we need to be and she will be continuing to see, oversee that. So the hope is next year when someone is here doing this budget presentation to you, hopefully that program will be almost completely implemented and then we will just be looking at ways of making it more effective. So it actually, that company is actually working with us. They have done felonies before, but they've never done a, a misdemeanor uh, court before, so they're actually using us as a test pilot. So again, we are actually going to be the model that other city attorney's offices and offices that handle misdemeanors will actually be hoping to follow. And so far, the transition on that program has been very successful. And that is all the questions I have. Um, appreciate those in the audience, but no one submitted a speaker slip. So uh, really appreciate, again, uh, thank you, uh, the different divisions and sections, uh, leadership. Uh, I think we all are very proud of the work City Attorney's Office does. Uh, I know on Monday we discussed a lot of the wonderful people that make it such a success. And thank you all for the budget presentation.
please pass along to the city attorney our best wishes for his remaining 18 days <laughs> and look forward to working with you in the new city attorney in 2018. Thank you again for the presentation. We will now stand at ease as we transition to the clerk's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Tyak and your team for such a quick transition. Uh, appreciate you being here, always welcome. And I will turn over the presentation to you and your team. Good afternoon, Council Member Stenziano and staff. I have with me today several very important people from my office. I have to my left, Chief Deputy Obi Lucas, Marilyn Stevens, who is a Public Re Relations Director, and also Crystal Ross to my right, she is my fiscal administrator. I couldn't do what I do without their help every day. Thank you for inviting me and us to come before you to present the objectives and accomplishments of the clerk's office for the 2017 budget year. I'm pleased to also present a brief overview of the clerk's office office budget request for the 2018 general fund and 2018 computer fund. I would like to begin my presentation with a little background. The court and the clerk's office were created by the state legislature and adopted into the city's charter in 1916. Our responsibilities are outlined in the Ohio Revised Code and simply put, we are responsible for maintaining court records and effectively collecting debt owed the court. We are also charged with managing public funds according to all legal mandates. The Franklin County Municipal Court is the largest municipal court in the entire state of Ohio based on the volume of cases handled annually. Its jurisdiction initially began with only the city of Columbus, but in 1955 it was expanded to countywide. Currently, the city of Columbus extends into Delaware and Fairfield County, and so does the jurisdiction. My office works daily with 21 law enforcement agencies and 19 mayor's courts. As of today, more than 1,700 criminal traffic cases have been transferred to our court for adjudication just in 2017. The clerk's office provides transparency and accountability in its daily operations. Annual audits performed by an outside auditing firm contracted by the City of Columbus have found zero infractions for several years standing. Additionally, the clerk's office releases annual reports outlining daily operations, case statistics, and financial statements as required by the Ohio Revised Code. In 2017, the highlights of our accomplishments include the implementation of electronic filing of income tax claims and environmental civil cases, working with our partners at the city attorney's office. We have even received a few pro se litigant filings. Overall, more than 3,000 new case and subsequent filings have been submitted and processed. In addition to providing technical support to over 400 users in the municipal court building, my staff of only seven in the Office of Information Services delivers services on court-related projects such as data sharing for outside agencies, data reports for the probation department. In particular, we are still working to complete our data pro program for the Ohio Community Supervision System, which I'm sure you'll hear more of from the court. Daily data reports are provided to partner agencies such as public defenders, victims advocates, prosecutors, and we also build new forms generated by our case management system for everyday use by judges and staff, setting up access profiles for new court personnel, prosecutors, and most importantly, creating new codes, court cost fees, and fines as required by new court rules and legislation enacted by the state legislature. The strategic priorities for 2018 include web chat, 
The clerk's office has identified the fact that web chat would be able to help service more individuals um, than just telephone or email. So we believe that implementing the web chat services um, in early 2018 will make a difference in how many uh, customers that we can handle on a daily basis. We also plan expansion of electronic filing not only in the civil division, but also for criminal filings, such as criminal complaints and traffic citations. This will provide timelier processing of new cases filed by law enforcement. A pay payment kiosk at the main jail is planned, which will deliver payout services to defendants when possible, in lieu of being booked into the jail. We also have other data sharing projects in the works and system integrations with the Columbus City Attorney's Office with their matrix system. Um, and we are still working on our digital continuity plan. And that is um, the plan to go to the next form of technology, whatever that may be. Currently, we have morphed from um, some types of um, images that come from microfilmed documents into actual image documents on our uh, system. So the next plan will be to integrate to that next method, whatever that would be. Our budget and fiscal management for 2018 um, is next, and our budget request is $12,576,830. As you can see, it's broken down into personnel, material supplies, and services. The vacancy credit that we've agreed to adhere to is 3.3% or savings of $388,486, the equivalent of seven employees. I think it's important to also show what our computer fund budget reflects. Our computer fund is a special revenue fund that is, uh, exists from court costs. $10 of all court costs go to build this fund towards technology. Personnel services, materials and supplies, services for operations, including contracts with um, vendors who provide specific um, services, debt principal payments, and interest on city debt. In 2006, we had uh, debt that we took out with the City of Columbus to allow us to image over 13 thousand boxes that were stored in the municipal court building. We spent roughly $2.7 million and we've had a 10-year payment repayment plan and we're coming to the end of that. So we're very pleased with that. The computer fund budget for 2018 is a little over $1.5 million. Our fiscal administration and procurement department, which only consists of two people, they handled over 318 contracts last this last year. I think it's important to note that all of those contracts have to go through city council and be approved through ordinances. So $1.2 million was allocated for contracts such as our case management support and maintenance, our e-filing system, bank services, remote data backup services, Oracle software support, collection services. We have over four collection agencies currently working to collect the debt owed the court file folders, imaging software and maintenance services, special income tax appropriations, the telephone system support and maintenance, which also is, uh, includes the court side. And we have just a few expansion requests. With regard to uh, our computer fund, we are asking for six employees to be transferred from the computer fund permanently into the general fund in order to continue to make sure that fund is solvent. We're also asking for an addition of a court view specialist. We currently only have one, and he's been with the office more than 38 years. So it's time to uh, begin training for that new employee. Our collections, as I mentioned, we have over four, we have four agencies working uh, for us. And if you consider the totals that were collected and dispersed through from January 2017 to the end of November, we referred over $5.1 million, or more than 20%, as compared to last year. Uh, the total collected was $1.13 million, and we have a 22% collection rate, which is average with other um, clerk's offices in Ohio. The total amount recalled from collection agencies was a little over $257,000. 
We have a number of collaborative efforts that we work with other agencies. You can see um, on the list here, Ohio Crime Stoppers, law enforcement agencies all over Franklin County, uh, the Justice Expo, Courthouse to the Community event, which was sponsored by you, Council Member Stenziano. Thank you for organizing that event and promoting it. It was a wonderful event. And I hope that we can continue that work in getting the word out to the public as to the services we offer. As long as you bring the popcorn machine. Absolutely. <laughs> Hope Works uh, was also one of the uh, projects we worked with, one of the local churches, and they had uh, several services offered by other agencies. I think it's important for um, Council to also realize that we have a number of charitable contributions that our staff uh, gives to annually. And over the last 10 years, we've contributed over $42,000 just from our employees to the charitable uh, giving campaign that is um, sponsored by the City of Columbus. We've had uh, blood drives, and this last blood drive this last year, we had over 86 donors. Every year, we go to St. Vincent's and provide gifts for all of the children. A lot of the children uh, only receive that one gift for Christmas, so it's very important to them and to our staff to continue sponsoring those children. This last year, we gifted over 88 children with gifts. In conclusion, I would just like to say thank you to Mayor Ginther, Director Lombardi, and staff, uh, you, Council Member Stenziano, and the other members of City Council, and all the citizens of Columbus and Franklin County for the opportunity to provide excellent public service. Thank you, and I'd welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Clerk, and thank you to your leadership team for the presentation. A uh, couple questions. With the increased utilization of technology, which your office has done a great job with, um, examples, you know, the document imaging, online payment system, e-filing, um, with that creating some efficiencies, can you talk about um, additional expenses that are associated with that, how those efficiencies have impacted uh, what I'll say is your bottom line, um, and overall with less paper records uh, being maintained, the impact that has on the office's budget. Well, our online payment process has been well received by our customers, and the process itself has improved the timeliness of payments made and reduced the time required to process those payments. So we're actually getting money into the accounts a little bit more quickly. Um, it has cut costs as far as banking fees, we are able to pass on the cost of paying with a credit card, which is roughly um, about $165 to $185 traffic tickets. The uh, cost to use a credit card online is about $3.65. So that has um, been passed off to the customer who is paying for the um, convenience of making an online payment. So we've saved that money, so we are receiving 100% of the costs and fines and saving the city about $70,000 a year on those costs alone. In 2017, more than 39,000 payments were made electronically for a total of about $7.3 million. We've also expanded our payment program to allow for electronic checks. Over 1,700 payments were received for a total of $367,000. Document imaging of cases has been uh, vital to maintaining the space issues that we have and the storage needs. It also provides real-time access for timely retrieval of case information for not only the clerks and the deputy clerks, but also the court and other users of our information. We've advanced our electronic filing initiative to include law enforcement partners, allowing timelier processing of traffic citations. We'll be beginning our electronic citation program uh, early next year, working with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, Upper Arlington Police, the Ohio Highway Patrol, and we're looking forward to working with new partners with the Columbus Division of Police. Some of the benefits of electronic ticket include faster remittance of payments of fines and costs and fees. Uh, at this time, I do not anticipate a um, reduction of staff, but over time with attrition, I expect that there will be less stuff needed to do basic responsibilities and daily op of daily operations. I appreciate that explanation, Clerk. Uh, one question that I think is going to be relevant both for your presentation and, and the courts uh, is the concern over decreasing revenue. 
uh, from filing fees, trying to kind of get around what's contributing to that decrease, uh, and if there's any avenues for additional revenue streams. I know you mentioned some costs being passed off, but where we can help uh, not only continue to make sure uh, services are where they need to be, but also recognizing the additional expansion requests, um, trying to find avenues to support those requests as well. Well, to answer the beginning of your question, um, there's really no way for my office to identify the factors that contribute to changes in case filings. It seems as though the economy has a huge impact on the number of cases filed across the board in our office. Um, just to give you um, an example, there's been a steady decline from 2010 to 2016 in the civil cases filed. Um, this year, cases are up in some areas and down in others. It's just the way that uh, those filings are presented to our office. We handle them an, on an as um, come first come first serve basis and uh, have no impact on the ability to raise revenue as far as that goes. Um, but in terms of revenue, you know, we are working consistently to develop methods to collect the debt owed the court. The Auditing and Internal Controls Division of my office has worked to improve communications with partner agencies such as the City Attorney's Office who defer court costs and filing fees until after the cases are settled. Those types of cases might include income tax filings filed in small claims, contract notes, past due water and electric accounts, and property damage. Recently, a local court rule was passed requiring court costs and fines be paid prior to the filing of a satisfaction of judgment. And over the past year, the clerk's office has worked to create new dockets to track costs associated with certified mail, ordinary mail, subpoenas, bailiff services, and show cause hearings, to name a few, so that they could be collected more effectively at the case end. Uh, as far as suggesting ways that we can increase revenues, again, we, we are a pass-through system. We take what is given to us, and we do the best we can to track and follow up on the costs and the debt owed the court. So those are all the questions I have. I do want to thank you, uh, Clerk, for your office and your service. I know you guys continue to receive accolades uh, for your approach and continue to look for solutions to provide uh, the best services uh, the clerk's office can. So really want to thank you for that. Look forward to our continued partnership, uh, not only as we get through the budget season, but as uh, we look forward to 2018 and other uh, challenges or opportunities as they arise. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here, and we will again stand at ease as we transition to the final presentation. Thank you. Thank you. got an on button, I can do this. I'm a pro in City Hall. <laughs> yes, I can. Thank you, Judge Barrows and uh, the staff and leadership team from the Franklin County Municipal Court. Uh, for that quick transition, uh, you will be closing out our evening portion uh, for this component of budget hearings. And I will now turn it over to the Honorable uh, Judge Barrows to begin the presentation and look forward to uh, hearing uh, your comments regarding the 2018 proposed budget. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, Council Member Stenziano, Chair of the Judiciary and Court Administration Committee. I'm Judge Ted Barrows, Chair of the Municipal Courts Finance and Budget Committee. With me this evening are Emily Shaw, our court administrator, Molly Gauntner, our chief probation officer, and Tanika Jackson, the court's finance director. Thank you for this opportunity to address the court's 2018 operating budget. The city has a stellar finance department, and we appreciate their support and guidance through this very important process. 
The court's 2018 budget, as recommended by the mayor, announced to $18,865,752, which the court feels is not sufficient to meet our 2018 operating expenses in a way that best serves the citizens of Columbus and Franklin County, as I will outline below. The 2018 general fund includes $381,772 to provide essential contract services for evening and weekend building security. Additional general fund monies will continue to support the specialized dockets program. Over the past 12 years, five innovative and problem-solving dockets have been created, certified by the Ohio Supreme Court, and are actively operating at the municipal court. The court has developed valued partnerships with other federal, state, and local governmental agencies, as well as private treatment providers, nonprofits, and others, to familiarize program participants with the services that are available to them. The specialized dockets focus on mental health, drug and alcohol dependency, including a rigorous heroin court program, human trafficking, and a program dedicated to our military service members and veterans who experience multiple interactions with law enforcement and the court. These dockets help the court provide wraparound care so that underlying issues that contribute to a participant's criminal behavior may be successfully resolved. Specialized dockets have reduced the overall number of jail nights, improved community safety through lower recidivism rates, reunified families, and have returned many participants to a productive life contributing to the community in a positive way. The court's 2018 request of $340,000 from the city to support the specialized docket programs is a carryover amount and remains the same as last year. The Franklin County Commissioners continue to echo their support and are pledging an equal amount an equal match in the amount of $340,000. The court offers its sincerest thanks to you for helping us maintain these life-changing dockets. The court is appreciative of general fund monies provided by the city for the operation of the court. But there are three expansion requests that were not funded. And I'm requesting council in its review of the budget submitted by the mayor to add funding so that the court continue its work in an efficient, positive, and safe way. The first request involves our security personnel, other than evenings and weekends, who are charged with the responsibility of safeguarding the entire municipal court building during regular business hours. The 2018 general fund budget includes $381,772 to provide essential contract service for evening and weekend building security, but the court's cost for security services have historically largely been paid from a special revenue account created by the General Assembly and funded by court costs. They have not generally been paid by the city's general fund. However, the security fund is being impacted by lower revenue generation, as you've heard in a previous presentation, and by higher expenses. Therefore, it is being depleted at a rate higher than the fund revenues can support. The reason for the declining balance is directly attributable to the ongoing payment of personnel expenses from this fund, and as you know, the increasing costs for health coverage. This special revenue was established to provide for security-related expenses, like the x-ray machines, the building camera systems, the card reader door locks, and many other necessary items required to provide security-related services to 17 elected officials, their staffs, and the general public as a whole. It was not intended to bear payroll expenses for the court's security staff. You may recall that in 2016, the court had to come to council for special funding. The reason for that was that it became apparent that the security systems in place, specifically the video monitoring system, were in tatters. Many of the cameras which guard the safety of the public and staff were not working. It was also revealed that not all of the recording devices were working correctly. The equipment was old, worn out, and in need of replacement. On behalf of the court, I am embarrassed to come to council in between budgets to ask for additional funding, especially when replacing such systems is precisely what the statutorily created fund was designed for. Since that incident, the court, working with the invaluable assistance of the city finance department, 
has determined to begin financial planning to implement a replacement schedule for security equipment and operating software. This equipment is used to screen, monitor, and appropriately manage access to over a million visitors to the facility annually. It's vital that the operability of this equipment be both maintained, upgraded, and replaced on a scheduled plan, and more frequently than has been done in the past. The equipment and software used for security services is very expensive, as evidenced by the 2016 capital expense for new equipment and software. The revenues generated by court costs for the Security Special Revenue Fund will not be able to support this type of planning and continue to pay for the majority of personnel expenses. This expansion request was submitted to transfer 17 security officers plus benefits and insurance out of the Security Special Revenue Fund and into the General Fund for a total of $1,226,690. In order to avoid future threats to security and to be able to effectuate the replacement plan referenced previously, we are asking for this expansion to become a permanent part of our General Fund budget. And I will add parenthetically that over the last three years, we have year after year asked the Finance Department to gradually move these security personnel over from the security fund into the general revenue fund, and it hasn't happened. We've talked about it, but it hasn't happened. We asked for it again this year, and they said, well, that's an expansion request. So here we are with an expansion request. The second request was for five probation officer positions, plus benefits and insurance, for a total of $363,345. In 2016, the Franklin County Municipal Court made a commitment to become a part of the Stepping Up Initiative and also an evidence-based organization that follows the risk, needs, and responsive principles, responsivity principles. The R&R principles tell the court who to target, what to target, and how to appropriately match offenders to programming. The R&R principle requires the use of actuarial risk and needs assessment tools engagement of the offender in the supervision process, the use of cognitive behaviorally based interventions, and the incorporation of a behavioral management system. In an evidence-based organization, which is what we are becoming, probation officers are agents of change as opposed to compliance monitors. They use motivational interviewing techniques and skill building interventions in their supervision responses in order to achieve risk reduction and behavior change, and less recidivism, and fewer demands on the court and the police. Part of this paradigm shift involved restructuring the probation department based on risk and need. This differentiated risk-based supervision response helps ensure that each defendant receives the appropriate level and intensity of supervision and programming as indicated by their assessment. No longer does one size fit all. An important component of risk reduction supervision is ensuring that caseload sizes in the moderate and high risk supervision responses are such that they allow for the timely administration of assessments, the appropriate frequency of and duration of office contacts with offenders, and the proper dosage of treatment and programming. Achieving the necessary reduction in caseload assignments given the probation department's current staffing levels and volume of moderate and high risk defendants is presenting a challenge to meet the rigorous compliance standards of the evidence-based model. And the opiate epidemic is not helping. Therefore, the court is requesting that you invest in five additional probation officers to assess and supervise its moderate and high-risk caseloads. Substantiated research informs us that agencies that apply the RNR principle with fidelity increase the potential to create valuable cost savings and transform community supervision into a powerful force for public safety. The last request that the court has for, is for $125,000 for the continuation of work release. And I'd like to thank council for approving ordinance 2701-2017 in October of this year, authorizing a supplemental appropriation in support of the court's work release program in the amount of $25,000. This investment in the program allowed for the continuity of services for the remainder of 2017. For many years, the court has been fortunate to receive both state 
and city funding to assist in the operation of its work release program. The court's work release program has proven to be an invaluable sentencing option. It provides an alternative response for mandatory jail sentences. It serves as a cost-effective and appropriate condition of pretrial release or probation supervision and allow judges to consider this residential community resource as a measured and appropriate response to probation violations. The work release program allows the individual to maintain his or her employment and provides an opportunity for the individual to pay toward their court-ordered restitution, fines, costs, and child support. The per diem rate at the work release program is $66, compared to almost $97 in the county jail per diem. The cost-saving nature of work release program is underscored by the fact that each work release participant is required to pay a subsistence of 25% of their gross income while in the program to help offset the cost and extend the funding that you provide us. Lastly, the work release program allows the county's most restrictive and costly resource, its county jail beds, to be reserved for higher risk and higher need defendants. As noted above, not only in 2017, but on several occasions previously, the court has come to council outside of the normal budget process to request continued funding for this valuable program. What I'm asking of you tonight is to build in this cost to our annual budget. On behalf of the court, I've been proud to present funding requests that adequately cover the court's expenses for the coming year, and I've done so each year for the last four years. But to a certain extent, I'm embarrassed to have to come back periodically to ask for additional funding, even for an invaluable program such as this. Now, prior to June 31, 2017, the court received $200,000 in the form of a Community Corrections Act grant from the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, the State of Ohio, and periodic funding from this council. This money allowed the court to contract for 21 work release beds at Alvis, a requirement of the CCA grant is that the court divert a minimum of 131 defendants from the county jail each year. With these resources, the court has diverted an average 435 defendants from the county jail each year. This average total number of diversions equates to approximately 3,500 jail beds saved each year, and at 97 bucks a shot, that's $350,000. The city funding is earmarked for City of Columbus charged cases only, while the state dollars could be used for either City of Columbus, suburban, or state charged individuals. Unfortunately, ODRC imposed a significant reduction to the 408 jail diversion funding line in the fiscal year 18 and 19 state budget. This drastic cut resulted in suspension of the work release program for a while. The City of Columbus has historically allocated the $200,000 or $250,000 to the court on a biannual basis during the month of July. So it necessitated the $25,000 special that we had to ask for in October to keep our doors open. As a result of the budget cut and the ensuing shortage of funds in 2017, Franklin County provided $100,000 for the remainder of 2017 to ensure that the work release program could continue through the end of the year. The county also committed to providing an additional $200,000 for 2018. Franklin County's crucial financial investment in this program is a testament to the positive impacts that can be made when government works, governments work together. As a result, I'm pleased to tell you that we can continue to provide this important program of restorative justice and that city funds will be spent only on city charged cases. I only ask that you regularize this investment by making it a part of our budget rather than requiring an annual or biannual request for continued funding. As the court takes a restorative and therapeutic justice approach toward how we may better re reduce and prevent recidivism, continued collaboration with other government partners, city council, the mayor, Franklin County Common Pleas Court, Franklin County commissioners, the sheriff, is essential and will lead to greater program efficiencies cost-saving measures, and increased resources, all of which affect the court's ability to be seen as positive problem solvers. I want to highlight one other thing that's not in these comments, and I made reference to the Stepping Up program. This is one where, with additional resources, 
uh, provided at, at the initially by grant and now that we've absorbed. Uh, we're having people interview people before they first appear in arraignment court, going into the jail and interviewing people before they first appear in arraignment court and making recommendations for the condition of their release so that the judge who is setting bond has information that can help him or her make a decision other than a standard money bond. In other words, I'll authorize that you be released on your recognizance, but I'm going to require that you engage in counseling, or I'm going to require that you drop uh, urine once a week and that you not uh, consume any alcohol or substances of abuse. And then we've got staff to follow up to make sure they do those things. Once again, keeping people out of jail who are presumed innocent and protecting the community. Um, that ends my prepared remarks. I've been informed that you may have some questions. And our previous, uh, previous recipients of your questions <laughs> proven that that will be true. So fire away, Council Member Cinciano. Well, thank you, Judge. And I, I appreciate uh, the court's ongoing um, discussion of the proposed budget and the budget process. I know in my one year, 11 months and 13 days as chairing <laughs> uh, the committee, uh, we've gone a little back and forth on how we best can address the ongoing needs, ongoing um, services and where there have been gaps and kind of what past practices and how to kind of get both uh, the city side and the court side on the same page. So I appreciate uh, your all's willingness to continue to collaborate in that regard. Let me give it right back at you. I have appreciated your willingness and approachability when we've had problems uh, to help us figure out ways to work them out, and it's refreshing. And I don't want to take anything away from your predecessor, but um, we didn't know how to use you. Uh, she's told us how to use you, and you've stepped right back to the plate, so we've appreciated that. I appreciate that. Um, so I will have a couple questions. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that has um, been kind of kicked around is just in terms of the statistics of those that you all work with, with are, are they all in the city of Columbus or outside? How do you keep track of that? If you don't, is there a way to start capturing that? Well, the first thing uh, is that the clerk of courts is the person who keeps the records, and I believe that our, her, our um, the court view system is capable of rendering those reports. I will tell you, uh, and I made reference to her annual report, that for 2016 of criminal charges, 17% of those charges were filed under Columbus city codes, 80% were filed under state code, and 3% were filed under city codes of one of the suburbs. Now, the 80% figure under state code includes all felonies filed in the municipal court. The only jurisdiction we have over them is for an initial appearance and a preliminary hearing, which are never held, but nonetheless, they're filed, so they're part of her statistical analysis. When I did a little math adjusting to remove those felony cases, um, then approximately 20% of the misdemeanor charges were filed under Columbus City Code. That doesn't mean they weren't filed by the Columbus Division of Police, because many times when there may be a multiplicity of charges, and some of them are available under city code and other charges are available under state code. They may have different penalties and there may be a number of tactical or strategic reasons why a state code charge is significantly important, even if it's filed by a city official. Uh, we mentioned that there continues to be decreases in funds available. Uh, similar to what I asked the clerk, uh, what ideas or look for additional revenue have you all looked at and what kind of falls within the appropriate ability to do that? Well, I, had, I did have an answer on the reduction. And I said that civil cases have been essentially flat for the last four years. That was the initial question uh, that your staff indicated you might be interested in. Because uh, I look back, uh, and they appeared to be in the same range this year. In 2013, there were 42,393. 2014 was 44,257. 2015 was 42,774, 2016 was 41,626, year to date 42,576. <clears throat> so they don't show a decline over the last four years. But in the previous 10 years, uh, filings were as high as in the 50 to 60,000 range. So um, I can't account for that. Maybe the economy. It seems to me that as people became indebted after 2008, unable to pay their bills, there would have been an increase in filings <clears throat> to collect from those people as they fell into poverty and were unable to pay their bills. But that didn't appear to happen. So I don't know if they, in the private bar, if they figured out other ways to collect debts, because the civil cases in the municipal court, 85, 90 percent of them are collections cases for unpaid debts. 
So I cannot account for the, for the decrease. I will say um, that the court's computer fund is relatively stable despite those drops, but it does reflect the same trends. Uh, from 2004 to 2009, revenues were in the range of 500,000 plus. From 2010 through 2014, they were in the range of 400,000 plus. Since then, they have ranged from mid to high 300s. Uh, the vast majority of civil filings are debt collection cases. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is to that question. The amount that we get is set by the state statute, and if the General Assembly was generous enough to raise that from three to four dollars per case, then we would increase our, our take by 33 percent. Um, there was a question about what other revenue streams could offset this lost revenue. And I don't mean to be didactic and lecture, but it seem, it's frequently important to recognize that the court is not a revenue generating thing. It is a, it is a uh, function of government that's necessary to help us maintain order. There is a cost to it. And whatever we generate within the court will never match up to those, those costs. Uh, the auditor came to us a year or so ago and said, you know, you guys haven't changed your payables on, on minor misdemeanors in a number of years, and your, your revenues coming back to the city have dropped. We sat down and increased our payables um, by, I don't know, 10 or 15 percent across the board for those minor misdemeanor offenses that people can pay without coming to court. But beyond those kinds of things, I don't think there's anything within our character that we can do to increase our revenues. I will say, though, um, that our new probation department that is just running like a bunch of Energizer bunnies and doing all this great work has also found its uh, real soul in getting grants. And in the past year, as I understand it, have been able to leverage about two and a half million dollars worth of grants using the sitting funding that's provided for a st starting point and then getting reaching out to the state and the federal governments when money's available and getting it in for those purposes that we can. So we're, we're doing what we can to keep up, but the times are catching up with us. And, and the other piece of this is the evidence-based practice that we're talking about. This is proven stuff that will help res reduce recidivism, at least for that individual. It's not going to solve society's problem. It's not going to make the opiate crisis go away. But that person is going to be less likely to come back in subsequent years. But you can't get improvement without spending some money up front on it. So that's really why I'm asking you for those five people to capitalize on the start we've made and to really jumpstart it so we can show good results coming back in a year or two. Which actually segues uh, very well into my last question in terms of additional consideration for collaboration. Um, has there been any discussion uh, with Franklin County Common Pleas Court's probation department that yes. would increase efficiency and avoid any potential duplication of services? Yes. And on its face, that makes a whole lot of sense. And there have been those discussions in the past. There haven't been any of those discussions in the past year and a half. And the reason was because there were, first of all, there were a number of specific things that they excluded. The, the adult probation department for Franklin County excluded from consideration. They didn't want domestic violence cases. There were a number of cases that they didn't want. And so of the ones that there were, you had to think about it. They're not going to send us any felons to supervise. So it's a one-way street. And the question is, what's really in it for them? So we, did, we have had those attempts. Now, I will tell you that if somebody lives in another county, we do have an active um, protocol for doing transfers to another county to supervise, and even to another state. We have somebody from Georgia who comes up here and, and picks up an OVI charge, and we want them under supervision. We have a, a protocol in place by which we can contact authorities where they live and ask them to undertake supervision. If, they, if the people screw up, they still have to come back up here. This court retains jurisdiction to uh, go through the probation revocation process, but the local authorities will uh, undertake the week-to-week, month-to-month supervision. And they can apply their own requirements for that supervision. So the person may have to do more in Macomb County, Georgia, than they would have to do in Franklin County, Ohio. So we are doing that on, a, on an intrastate and an interstate basis. We're just not doing it here in the county because there doesn't seem to be anything much in it for the adult probation authority. I appreciate that explanation. Okay. Uh, I don't have any additional questions, and no one from the audience uh, submitted any speaker slips. We so tried to that, drum up some support. I 
you guys never hesitate to drum up support, but I appreciate you taking the time to be here uh, explaining the frustration and um, the concern that uh, what is proposed isn't sufficient and particularly the three areas uh, where the greatest need are. And so I appreciate the frankness and the opportunity to continue to work together to address that. I do always appreciate your and the other uh, 16 judges service uh, and the ongoing challenges you have down the street um, and I know we've had that discussion of what kind of what we do here and the impact it has down there and uh, just the kind of creation of the statutory structure that gets us all working together, um, particularly during budget time. So appreciate uh, you all taking the time um, for that presentation generally and from everything we've heard, I want to thank the city attorney's office, uh, Clerk Tyak and her team and Judge Barrows and uh, the rest of the leadership team uh, for being here tonight. I truly am grateful for the work uh, that you all do down the street and also appreciate the work that the staff does back here. Uh, Brian Shin, Trenton Weaver, Kevin McCain, and Matt Erickson in terms of getting me prepared and on our ongoing work on initiatives, concerns, questions as they arise throughout the year. I do encourage those looking for more information to visit the city attorney's website at www.columbuscityattorney.org or call 614-645-7717. The Franklin County Municipal Court Clerk's website at www.fcmc clerk.com or by calling 614-645-8006 and the Franklin County Municipal Court website at www.fcmcclerk.com backslash judges. If you're looking for more information on the overall proposed 2018 operating budget, again, you can find that online at www.columbus.gov slash finance. You can always contact my office for additional information at 614-645-8084 or email me at mcinziano at columbus.gov. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Again, thank you all and have a wonderful night. Thank you, sir. Thank you.